Okay, we are perfect. We, <laughs> just as we go live, Representative Middleton is there. So uh, thanks everybody for joining us today for a special live stream. My name is Doug Kellogg. I'm State Project Director with Americans for Tax Reform. Uh, HR on the state policy front, we have a podcast and uh, we do live stream interviews and and uh, release the audio on our podcast the feed for uh, From the Swamp to the States, our state-focused podcast. So we're really happy to have everybody joining us today on Facebook, Twitter, wherever you are. And um, we're going to have a discussion which will be very interesting, I think, to all taxpayers. And um, a frustrating one, but hopefully we can make some progress and uh, talk about some solutions to this issue. And that it is taxpayer funded lobbying. So we have taxpayers across the country uh, and over 30 states who pay for uh, who have government pay for tax dollars and pay for lobbyists to go and then lobby government in order to get earmarks, uh, handouts, additional costs, and essentially encourage more government spending. So if you're a taxpayer, probably not going to be a fan of, of the government using your money to lobby for more more taxes and spending. So we have two great guests on uh, this topic. Really excited to have them with us. Elizabeth Stell with the Commonwealth Foundation out of Pennsylvania, and uh, Mays Middleton of Texas, who also chairs the Taxpayer Protection Caucus there in the legislature. Uh, consists of state, state legislators who have taken the Taxpayer Protection Pledge, uh, promising to their constituents not to increase taxes. So. Uh, Welcome to the welcome to the show, Elizabeth and Mays. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And um, let's uh, let's start with the background on the issue. Um, and Elizabeth, you all wrote a really in-depth report. And you've written a number of good articles on taxpayer-funded lobbying. Um, so, talk a little bit more about what, what do we mean by taxpayer-funded lobbying? What what exactly is going on? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, we have a situation in Pennsylvania and many other states where there are a host of different associations and groups uh, that collect dues or uh, money from a government entity. In our case, it's a lot of school districts and, and county groups and boroughs. And then those groups turn around and uh, lobby on behalf of those government associations. So it's taxpayer dollars going to a specific government entity for a specific purpose, and those dollars being repurposed to lobby for whatever the government entity wants. So a common example in Pennsylvania is a school district that pays to the school boards association, which then turns your money for schools. So you can see how this is a perverse cycle. Uh, the incentives are all wrong and there's very little accountability. So you have um, in some cases, no information, a lack of information. Uh, we did just a really just a first glimpse at the scope of the problem in Pennsylvania and found we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of $42 million um, that's being funneled to these associations and in some cases to actual lobbyists to lobby for more government spending. So it's your tax dollars being used to raise your taxes, um, which is incredibly infuriating to many people, understandably. So uh, the problem is extensive. It goes all the way from your local town government uh, to your um, to your state missions. Um, so it's across the board, and uh, there's a there's something that we can do about it. Sorry, we're just trying to deal with the feedback and get that uh, loop reduced a little bit. Um, so keep working on that. Hopefully, it's still audible for everybody. Um, so yeah, let's talk, you know, how much is being spent? Um, how many states do this currently? And, and, um, you know, what are the, what are the costs that you all see? Yeah, in Pennsylvania it's 42 million. Um, I'm not sure what it is across other states. Um, uh, but that's, that's the ballpark figure we're looking at here in, uh, in our state. And in taxes, it's very similar. Maze, if you're on a phone or anything, we're getting a little lack of um, 
lack of audio there. So you started out okay, and then we lost you. Oh, is that better? Can you hear a little better now? Yep. Sorry, I had to do the phone because I had a computer issue. But, um, you know, it's $41 million per year uh, in taxes. And the thing that really first drew my attention to this issue is, you know, why is it so hard to pass meaningful property tax relief and reform you know, in the state of Texas? And, uh, you know, it, it's taken us, uh, I think, from 79 or I believe 81, the Pivotal bill, to 2019 to pass property tax limits. That's the first one. Um, and, you know, I mean, you look at that timeline and it was our money lobbying against that. Uh, we have a lot more work to do on property tax. Limits. It's actually a question I get a lot is why, why can't we provide more property tax relief? Well, one of the biggest reasons is that your own money is being spent on lobbyists to lobby against that. And they want more rent to the government for your own home, basically, at the end of the day. But it goes so much deeper than that. Um, this past session, you know, they opposed uh, election integrity. Uh, they opposed the ban on a state income tax, meaning they want a state income tax. Uh, and even more recently, after we passed the ban on critical race theory, taxpayer funded lobbyists, the Texas, Texas Association of School Boards, uh, actually adopted critical race theory into their statement of beliefs after we had passed the ban. So, I mean, you see this happen all over the country and it's wrong. Uh, we don't need a taxpayer funded middleman. We don't. That's our job as elected officials. And at the end of the day, this practice needs to be outlawed. Uh, it's hurting taxpayers. It's hurting our values. It's hurting our Texas values. And, you know, you think about the state and, you know, I don't know how well you all know Austin, but how well do you think the city of Austin represents the state of Texas? And, you know, that's where all the registered lobbyists live and work. And, and well, and that's a good point of what, um, what kinds of policies are they impeding or advancing that don't line up with um, you know, what taxpayers and voters would like to see? So I'll give you all a good example. Um, you know, recently, I think you've seen where the Biden administration, uh, it actually just came out yesterday, the FBI did investigate concerned parents as domestic terrorists. But did you know who requested that investigation? A taxpayer funded lobby group. National School Board Association. So NASB, sorry, National Association of School Boards actually requested that this past fall. So it was lobbyists using our money to try to have concerned parents investigated under the Patriot Act as domestic terrorists. Um, and, you know, it goes deeper than that. There's a tie to Texas. So the current NSBA president is the former TASB president. And TASB is the Texas Association of School Boards. Oh, so our money in Texas is going to the National Association of School Boards that's trying to basically make parents the enemy here for just being concerned. Uh, and we actually got some documents yesterday that I saw Jim Jordan sign one of the letters. Uh, and for example, uh, one mother was investigated because she opposed mask mandates and they said she had a gun, owned a gun. Um, so you're seeing these things that are uh, anti-free speech anti-Second Amendment, anti-taxpayer, and you're paying for it with your tax dollars. And so how did that relationship get started in the first place? What, what's the argument uh, back in the day when we start giving out money uh, to lobbyists to go lobby by government to go lobby government? What's the argument uh, that allows this practice to start when it seems like a clear conflict of interest? Oh, it is. You know, I mean, it doesn't make sense. It's actually not that old. Um, as best we can tell, this practice started somewhere in the 1960s or 70s. Uh, so before that point, everyone did what they were supposed to do, which is represent their constituents directly. You know, I like to remind everybody the state legislature is not trying to hire lobbyists to go to every school board or city council or commissioner's court, you know, and there are thousands of local elected bodies in the state of Texas. And we don't do that because that's our job to keep up with it, you know? And 
So at the end of the day, they're not representing the values of their communities. Uh, they're certainly not representing their taxpayers in their communities. And it's not surprising, you know, these taxpayer funded lobbyists often have a I think we've lost Maze there. Client or like, got double okay. dealer client sometimes. And I'll, I'll add on to that. That um, the back. you're back, but yeah. Well, and I had a story from 2019. Actually, my first session. Can y'all hear me now? Now we can. Yes. So in 2019, my first session, uh, I've got a good example of how taxpayer funded lobbyists. They don't even really represent their own clients very well, uh, even though what they're doing is anti-taxpayer. So, for example, there's a taxpayer funded lobby firm that represented the city of Houston to lobby against a cable franchise elimination bill. Turns out that same firm was hired by the Texas Cable Association to pass that bill. So they were double dealing their own client. And that's the thing is these lobbyists aren't just lobbying for cities, counties and school districts. You know, they're lobbying for other entities, too. Like I saw um, in the I think in May, late May of this past session, Tasby's lobbyist, Texas Association of School Boards lobbyist was in the gallery and he had multicolored socks on. And he was saying that he hoped the protect girl sports bill would fail. And of course, that's the bill that stops boys from playing girl sports, you know, and we know. About 72 to 75 percent of all Texans, whether Democrat or Republican, support that bill. And there was Tasby's lobbyist in the gallery against that. And, and I'll add on to that, that it's it's much broader than school districts or even local governments. Um, some of the the entities that use the most taxpayer funding lobbying from our just small sampling is uh, what we call SEPTA, which is the Transportation Authority of Philadelphia. Um, they're the worst offender of this. And oftentimes their lobbies don't come through. As, as you pointed out, they're not always um, they're not always the highest quality in terms of delivering on their promises. Other examples uh, are airport authority in outside of Pittsburgh uses a lot of taxpayer funding lobbying through contract lobbyists. Um, the Philadelphia Parking Authority, there's even a TV show about how terrible they are. Uh, so there's this is much broader than just education or um, just county associations, which is another big big offender in Pennsylvania. Um, this is across all levels of state local government. It must have done something right. We found out that there's a $2 tax for SEPTA on all rental car transactions in the, across the whole state. So not just if you live somewhere where you might actually get their mass transit service, but uh, so I, I don't know who did that. Hopefully not a taxpayer funded lobbyist, but. Yeah, and, and that's actually a big problem. A lot of our infrastructure spending goes to mass transit and these authorities and not you know across the state. Um, but yeah, it, it's much broader than just just the school boards, which are definitely a problem. Uh, it's it's across the board, and and the justification that we often hear is access. You know, well, these lobbyists have have the relationships and the access, and no one's going to listen to me. I'm just a township supervisor, or I'm just a county commissioner. Um, not the case. Uh, you know, you have your representatives in the state assembly for a reason, uh, but that's often the the excuse that we will hear um, from these local officials. Absolutely. Well, and that also gets to what's so unfair about it for taxpayers is it's very difficult to keep up with everything going on in the state legislature and taxpayers uh, have a big uphill uh, climb if they want to influence what's going on. And yet their earnings are being used to pay people to be there all the time, getting involved in these uh, different uh, budgets and, and various pieces of legislation and uh, ultimately advocating against the taxpayer's interest to, to get more money for their niche uh, niche project or get additional taxes, whatever it might be. Um, so that that is the the uphill the uphill climb and the unfair advantage uh, for for taxpayers. Um, so let's talk a little bit more. How, how do we start to address the issue? Is this just a legislative fix? Are there other things that need to happen? Uh, I know Representative Middleton, you had sponsored a, a bill on this, so. Why don't you take that question first? I mean, what, what did what did you see and how do you think we can address the issue? 
there's a lot of opposition in Austin over banning taxpayer funded lobbying. I would imagine every state has that because you're talking lobbyist paychecks. You know, this is the swamp. I always say this is the plug to the Austin swamp, the ban on taxpayer funded lobbying. We're working to pull it. And you know, the first session uh, that I had in the legislature in 2019, I had this bill banning taxpayer funded lobbying on the House floor and the gallery was lined with taxpayer funded lobbyists because they were worried about their paycheck. And the moment that it failed because 18 Republicans voted no, they got up and cheered. And you know, that is the voice of the Austin swamp and that is what we're up against here. Uh, and it's not fair. It's not fair to taxpayers. They're not paid to come up there. You know, when constituents from home are there, it's because they believe in it, they care about it. It's a good policy uh, that they support, you know, and it's not right that they're being forced to subsidize speech that they don't agree with. In fact, um, we had County Judge, Collin County Judge Chris Hill give great testimony as to that. He said, look, there's nothing wrong with local government hiring someone to come up there. That's what we want. Uh, we know who they represent. It's transparent. You can do open records on the emails and the phone calls and everything else like that. But you can't with lobbyists. This is for speech. Uh, and taxpayers are having to pay for, for advocacy and speech they don't agree with. Just, you know, counter, you can't always get the records. Um, in our experience, we only had about a 40% response rate. So even though we were asking very matter of fact questions, like, how much money did you send to the school boards association or the county commissioners association over three years? You know, more than half of the entities ignored us or for whatever reason, we're not able to even follow the law. So even, even entities that aren't contracting at lobbyists, but just have lobbying lobbyists in house, um, you don't always know exactly what they're up to. Uh, so, you know, the transparency is a, a huge issue here. Uh, and that's, you know, a whole nother um, aspect of what we found is that so many government entities are either incapable or uh, refusing to follow um, the open records walls in our state. And that is interesting. So is that something then that you essentially have to sue over in order to get records if they're just not providing them? Yeah, we'd have to appeal uh, and then there's a whole appeals process and then um, that has many layers to it. Uh, it, and so we chose not to at this point in time because we were uh, we were looking at records from thousands of entities. Um, but the idea is to prove the point that this is a pervasive issue, um, that it is near impossible to keep track of what is actually occurring. Um, in one instance, our Turnpike Commission, which we know they have lobbyists on contract because they report it in the lobbyist database, um, said they had no records, no records for us. Um, completely false, completely false. But again, there's there's no accountability here. So that's why it's so important to have the legislative uh, reforms move forward uh, so that these entities are at least restricted in, in the amount of taxpayer funding and lobbying they can do. It would seem like that would be a problem. They can't produce basic records on how they're spending money on this, um, but yet they get to continue doing so. I mean, it's sort of, it's being, the burden's being placed on you and legislators and Maybe it's more fitting for legislators to have to, to do something, but to to address an issue rather than you know the the agencies themselves who are spending the money, uh, you know, being incapable or maybe refusing to provide any transparency, basic transparency, uh, they can just continue to go on business as usual and be obstinate and not tell taxpayers, voters where the money's going, um, while somebody else has to spend the resources to to call them to account to to get that information out there um, should be another knock against uh, this process and this practice uh, continuing. Um, so we talked about, uh, we talked a little bit about legislative fix. Um, we can outlaw the practice. You know, if that were done, what do we think the ramifications and response would be? If you get a legislative a bill passed to ban this, will the government try to find ways around it and continue to, to spend money that maybe money they have more flexibility over how it's spent. Um, how, how do we make sure that it actually sticks and uh, what would the challenges be from that point forward? I think the best way to make it stick is as a taxpayer right of action. You know, uh, Texas passed the social media censorship ban uh, this past uh, special session last year. 
And the way that that bill is enforced is through a taxpayer, so a citizen right of action. Uh, and that's how it needs to be with the ban on taxpayer funded lobbying. It's up to us to enforce this. And I think that's the best way to do it because, I mean, we see, you know, liberal DAs and liberal county attorneys that won't follow the law, they won't prosecute. Um, so we could go that route, but I, I don't see that really being enforced like it should. It needs to be us because this is a taxpayer protection at the end of the day. So it should be the taxpayers that enforce it and make it happen. But you're going to laugh at this. So we did, you know, we did end up passing a disclosure law in 2019 uh, and it did not pass the session before the taxpayer funded lobbyist lobbied against the disclosure law. So they lobbied to hide how the money going to them was spent. You know, does that surprise you? They, they're they not proud of the practice, obviously, when you're lobbying to hide something. Uh, and they, they, they know, they know. When people find out about this, they hate it. They don't like it. No one likes their money being spent against them like this. Yeah, and I would add that there's a more fundamental issue here at play. When government has the power um, to get involved in things like, you know, parking, uh, then there's a lot of influence that comes with that. And if you can shrink the influence of government to the things that really matter, uh, then you take away some of this incentive for all the money in the system, for all of the, you know, the um, the conversations that happen behind closed doors. Um, so so that's a part of it too. Uh, and, and it just, I think, goes to show you how um, inefficient some of these government agencies can be and are. And uh, I think it's a, it's a good case for um, some questions about whether the government should even be involved in things like airports and turnpikes. Well, I'll add one more thing. Um, you know, there are some legislators that famously became taxpayer funded lobbyists after they left office. So you got to weigh that in uh, the ban and the opposition to the ban. Yeah, well, and it's a, there is a big difference also just to add that, um, you know, between the government spending money on lobbyists and, and private folks engage in government. I mean, we have, uh, you know, taxpayers and, and government need to need to know where those dollars are going. Um, and absolutely, that should should not be hidden. And the fact that it's, it's predictable that it's being lobbied against by the people uh, benefiting, but you know, that should be a public record, um, how that money is being spent. So um, that's certainly- And I think it's, it's a sign that there's something going on there. If people are pushing back, then you know it's meaningful and it's impactful legislation. And so that should be, I think, an encouragement to anyone that's involved in this fight. Yeah. And then, so there, there's a gravy train they want to keep rolling. I think then I think the final question would be, um, all of this seems very outrageous. <laughs> and that's a good point about, you know, hiding out how, how, you know, lobbyists lobbying to, to hide how they're being paid and what they're being paid uh, via government and, and getting their hands on taxpayer dollars. Um, if it's so outrageous, what is the holdup in, in getting this done? I mean, sure, the, the folks who are benefiting are going to lobby against it. Maybe they are really good lobbyists. Uh, we, although we were talking before about how they aren't that great, um, but you know that that shouldn't be enough to to stop this kind of a movement with an outrageous practice like this. Um, so how do we get over final barriers and, and see some reform to this? Because again, we're it's 30, 35 states, correct, that that have some form of this um, that we know of. I mean, that's a significant number. That's a lot of taxpayers who should be upset. Um, so. What do we do to get the job done? I think in our state, it's an awareness issue. I mean, people sort of knew this was an issue, but uh, we were able to really articulate it in the scope and size of it for the first time. And that did garner legislation. We've now had legislation in the House and the Senate in Pennsylvania to get rid of the contract lobbyists. So it's the first step. Um, but the challenge is just, you know, once you have a bill, how do you make that bill? Um, how do you have, how do you get momentum behind that bill? Uh, there's, you know, so many issues that are competing for lawmakers' attention. So I think continuing to um, to to emphasize um, the size and scope of this is helpful to building the momentum towards reform. Uh, but uh, you know, from from no legislation, no conversation about this a year ago to now having two bills, uh, you know, in terms of government, uh, that's lightning speed. I think right. You know it. So it is an awareness issue, um, you know, and people need to know, and, and by the way, uh, we've, we've seen the polling in Texas, over 90% of Republicans support the ban on taxpayer funded lobbying and over 70% of Democrats 
support the ban on taxpayer funded lobbying. This is actually a bipartisan issue. No one really likes this. Um, and I tell legislators all the time, vote your district, vote your district. Your district supports eliminating this. And a lot of people don't realize this is really not a single issue thing, right? I mean, taxpayer funded lobbying is in the way of a lot of other legislation that voters and constituents want to see happen. You know, like whether it's educational choice, uh, whether it's property tax relief, obviously the expansion of the ban on critical race theory, things like that, you know, election integrity. Um, these are the things that we were elected to do. And one of the biggest obstacles to that is lobbyists that are paid for with our own tax money. And that is fundamentally wrong and unethical. And it's got to stop. And, you know, for some, somehow we've gotten away uh, from that direct representation. I will say this also, though, that the taxpayer funded lobbyists, they lie a lot to local government. And they said that the ban on taxpayer funded lobbying criminalized county commissioners, city council, school board members from coming to Austin. That is a lie. It's a lie. It doesn't. That's what we want to encourage. We want to encourage that. We want to encourage employees of local government. If the elected officials can't come come to Austin, their expenses can be covered, hotel, whatever. Uh, we just don't want to pay contract lobbyists in Austin that clearly don't represent the values of our communities. So, so they lie to protect their own paycheck. Uh, and the more people that know that, the better. Uh, it was on the ballot uh, last time, so in the Republican primary ballot propositions in uh, 2020, and it passed overwhelmingly. Uh, it was a legislative priority for the Republican Party of Texas uh, in both 2019 and 2021. Uh, so the grassroots and the state of Texas are well aware of this issue, and they demand that we ban it. That's a great point that um, would actually bring more of the local officials to the state capitol. I mean, of course, somebody who is in local government absolutely should be talking to the state legislature about, you know, what, what they're doing, why they think they should do it. That's accountability. And there's a big difference in that between that and uh, them staying at home and hiring folks to muck things up there. So um, very good. Well, that's a great point um, to wind down on. And to thank you again to you both for joining us. We've had uh, Representative Mays Middleton and Elizabeth Stell with Commonwealth Foundation. <laughs> in Pennsylvania here for a live stream. And we fought through five minutes of bad audio. <laughs> and we've gotten, <laughs> gotten through a very good discussion. So really appreciate you all. A great insight, uh, very important issue. It sounds like there really is an opportunity here to get a lot of momentum behind this. And it's getting in the way of other issues. It's unfair to taxpayers. It's added costs. It's not transparent. I, you know, you can add a few, you guys can add a few more points as to why it's bad. Um, and uh, so I appreciate, appreciate you all joining us today. Appreciate your work on this issue. And, and uh, Representative Middleton will have to have uh, other state legislators or from around the country talk to you and uh, talk to the folks in Pennsylvania who are sponsoring these bills for reform and, and continue to and look to that example and, and follow that model. And we can get this spread around the country. So. Um, hopefully this is the start of even more success on this issue. So thank you all again. Thank you all for having me on today. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth and Doug. Yes, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely.